circuit. How was it that they were able to resolve for the principal agent problem of the firm in order to generate the capital that the market needed to function? What did they do? They had freedmen, these were the agents. Now, because they were freed slaves, they had a loyalty towards their owners. And these owners were the people who invested in the world. So because of this inherent loyalty or you know, the feeling of owing something to another individual, that enforced the agent to be loyal in this particular situation. So we have here, in a sense, an opportunity to consider the firm at a very basic level, which I think from the point of view of management is fundamental, because it strips so many externalities from the question of the firm and invites us to think of the firm in, a very, in, in the terms of its very pure functioning. How do we resolve the inherent agency cost of a firm? And so your suggestion is that in order to, for the modern firm or for the firm in general, in order to solve for the agency cost problem, the first thing we need to do is institute slavery, right? So let's enslave a bunch of people. I like it. So let's send uh, BP or ExxonMobil or PepsiCo off to some place and say, we'd like to collect a thousand slaves because we're going to be hiring soon. And we've understood that the way that we can control our agency costs is first to enslave a whole bunch of people. This is, this is a model of capitalism, surely. That even the most radical University of Chicago free marketeer might say, that goes a little far. A couple of boundaries may be crossed there. I think it worked very well in the role of great context, but in the modern scenario, if you want to see a similar kind of mechanism, then it's through the for all options. And it's through the employee stock option. Yes. I see. So you're saying essentially that the employee stock option is the modern form of slavery. I, I'm teasing you, but yes, you're quite right. We sh as the briefing indicates, this institution or this, uh, the institution of slavery and the role of the freed man, as they were called, so the manumitted slave in Roman society, uh, occupied a key place in terms of enabling the firm to come into existence. Why was that? Why was this, we, we call it a found institution, that is to say the Romans didn't invent slavery so that one day they could have a functioning grain trade, right? It was because they had had this, well, it's an ancient phenomenon, right? Because there was the institution of slavery, which meant simply that you were deprived of the rights of a citizen. Uh, because of that, they were then able to derive a firm-driven response to the market problem. So the question is, what was it about the institution of slavery as it existed then that enabled then the Romans to to, to compensate for what we would see as the systemic agency problems of the firm. The loyalty is a problem as well, and they must have under the umbrella after they became freemen. Loyalty, yeah. I think it's fear. Fear? Yeah. It's because they, they, most of them are actually born slaves. Yeah. And that's how they mutually knew. The moment they actually experienced not being slaves because they worked themselves out of being slaves or because they were granted the right not to be slaves. In certain cases, yes, there were mechanisms which could have been coercive in that way, but I don't think fear alone, I mean, we should be skeptical of that, right? It's an optimally or near optimal efficient market that's functioning for 500 years. Would we predict that a market based on fear is likely to be able to sustain itself for 500 years? It's not, only fear. not only fear. So fear may be part of it. Okay, yes. Reputation. Reputation, why? This is the key mechanism that allows for this control of agency costs. When, when a slave, so when one, of these, uh, when one of these slaves was manumitted, meaning given their freedom uh, by their owner, they would take on the last name often of the owner and thereby enter into the reputational sphere of that family which meant that essentially the reputational capital that accrued to that name was now being extended to them. So that the reputation uh, on, this one, on, on the ownership side now also extends to the reputation on the agency side. And that serves nicely to align incentives because it means that the normal gap that we would predict between a principal and an agent is resolved since in effect the reputational mechanism for both is more or less the same. It wasn't only like that. We shouldn't certainly paint a picture of a Roman world with happy slaves running around saying, I'm looking forward to the day of getting my freedom uh, so that I may then go out and engage in further uh, stock option style servitude to my master. Um, and we know this because there are other found institutions that make this system work. For example, how many of you were surprised to read 
that not only did the Romans sign or have a very robust contract law, but they signed contracts in triplicate. Kept a copy for themselves, so a copy for both parties of the transaction, and a copy filed elsewhere so that you could go back and make reference to it. And we, indeed, we find a very robust uh, legal culture that is able to enforce those contracts. How many of you were surprised to find the kind of quality controls that exist across this market? You may remember that one of the ways that grain was shipped was with little pouches of the product uh, next to the actual grain so that you could inspect it and see uh, through this small sample what it was that was in the hold of the ship. Uh, and you remember as well the uh, description of the measuring or checking for the quality when it actually arrived at the port of Rome, these very careful measures and so on. So there are these mechanisms for monitoring the flow of the commodity across the supply chain. And those are essentially coercive, which is to say you sign a contract and then there are terms of those contracts and you're bound to them. <coughs> but are those coercive mechanisms effective in determining good results for a firm-driven use of this market. In other words, is that kind of monitoring and that kind of contractual relationship effective in constraining negative outcomes on behalf of agents who are working for you, on the part of agents working on your behalf? When you go work at a firm, every time you do something, do you go sign a contract with your boss? No. That's all external, right? So those coercive mechanisms that we see are moments of external control, so external relationships to the market. But the internal mechanics of the firm are not governed by those kinds of coercive mechanisms. They're self-governing. There is some element that's within the firm itself that's constraining agency costs that exists outside of the legal institutionalism and the kinds of quality mechanisms uh, that were in place. So that brings us back then to this question of reputation and trust trust and reputation as a way for constraining systemic agency costs. If we think about it, it's a really remarkable thing. Because in our modern context, we think of, in terms of constraining agency costs, we think of the need to monitor. How do you know that when you send somebody out far, far away to purchase something for you, to negotiate a contract for you, whatever, how do you know that they're doing a good job? What are you going to ask from them? Send me an email. I want a report. I want a quarterly report. I want a daily report. I want a weekly report. I need to know. Call me on the phone. Send me an email. Chat on BlackBerry. Right? Monitoring. We need to know what you're doing. How did the Romans monitor their agents? They have to see. They did, but how is that effective monitoring? When your Roman agent is in Alexandria negotiating a grain purchase based on the spot price, how do you know that he is getting the best price for that grain at that moment? Are you calling him on the phone? You don't. You simply cannot know. There is no way to move. Information can only move as fast as the fastest boat or the fastest horse. Which means that when the agent goes far flung, far, as far away as in a far flung place, acting as an agent, you have no ability to monitor him at all. So we would normally say, well, under those conditions, the firm can't exist. And if it can exist, it will exist under very suboptimal conditions. You would expect to see tremendous amounts of operational inefficiency. That's simply the nature of agency itself. There's a very famous work by uh, a business historian, Alfred Chandler, called The Visible Hand. Uh, and Alfred Chandler is the person who uh, gives us our understanding of what he refers to as managerialism. That is to say, how the rise of hierarchy, managerial hierarchies arrive, arise in order to enable the firm. Because if you can't have managerial hierarchies, you don't have a firm. You just have a bunch of individual entrepreneurs in small shops. And his argument is, and it's a very good argument, is that in the, and he's looking at the US, but the same model would apply uh, elsewhere, is that you don't actually have the firm until you have the telegraph and the railroad. Until information can move at the speed of an electron so that you can monitor people in far-flung uh, far places, the firm is a very unlikely entity to exist. Right? And I think we'd probably agree with that. That makes a lot of sense. If you don't have an ability to monitor, why would you erect a firm in the first place? It's simply too much risk for capital. There are other better ways to generate returns for your capital than entering into a risky organizational proposition like this one. 
And yet the Romans found a way actually to set up a firm driven response absent any kind of effective day-to-day -day monitoring. And they did so very well. And I go back to what I said at the beginning. It's not just that the Romans were able to do this effectively, but we have a benchmark for how successfully they did it. How successful was it? Very successful. A million people for 500 years. Literally the largest city the world had known and would know in the West until the 19th century when it was finally surpassed by London. So it's not just that the Romans were able to compensate for this, they were able to do so in a way that led to optimal, optimal results, optimal market efficiencies. And what did they have? They had, in addition to these other coercive it's extra organizational institutions, they had this mechanism of reputation, which invites us then to focus on the mechanism of reputation, to ask us about the question of incentive, since it seems to be, this is what the Roman grain trade tells us, it seems to be fundamental to how firms work. Outside then of the monitoring mechanism, which we might normally look to as a way of understanding to, uh, how to constrain agency costs, the Roman case invites us to put our focus someplace else. What do we need to think about when we come to think about the firm as an agency cost problem? And that is, by the way, a central role of management. What do we need to think about? And what it suggests is, well, one of the things we need to think very carefully about is this question of reputation, trust, and incentive. What kinds of reputational trust and incentive mechanisms are we putting in place in our organization in order to optimize outcomes? That question was relevant 2,000 years ago. That question is still relevant today.